Hey, I'm Will Vajaro, and I'm going to be reading from my novel Love Stories and Too Violent for Me, which has recently been reissued by Gutter Books. So, uh, this chapter is called uh, Blue Confessions. <clears throat> I was a teenage hound dog. Those were the days, boy. You see, life wasn't always like this for me. You might say I'm the James Dean of romance, a brief, brilliant career that was abruptly, prematurely, and violently aborted by a sudden and deadly crash. I guess I was just going too fast and not watching where I was going. Now I'm a legend, a dead legend. Oh, I get around, but I'm a love zombie, an amorous George Romero reject. Late at night, lying wide awake in my bed, playing with myself for relaxation, I kept imagining Valerie as Barbara Crampton in the animator, screaming nude and strapped to a lab table while I ate her out with my dismembered head held between her squirming legs with my own cold and dead hands. Then she turned into Rose. That was too sick, so I stopped after a while. My New York days were a lot different than my San Francisco ones, to say the least. I was young and naive, and the future beckoned me onward to fulfill my dreams of romantic grandeur. I was full of promise or something. That promise may yet be realized, but so far it feels like a raw deal was pitched and signed a long time ago, and I'm just getting around to realizing it. I think about my youth a lot when I listen to the modern rock station, which plays a lot of stuff from my heyday, which ended around the mid-80s somewhere, peaking around the same time as Miami Vice. Listening to Tainted Love by Soft Cell or I Ran by a Flock of Seagulls pulls me back instantly to my glory days with Valerie. The pain is exquisite. I don't know why I listen to that stuff anymore. I should just stick to the jazz station and not torture myself with tunes from the recent past. Just escape into an era where I never even existed. But there I was, pumping up the volume as Aha's Take On Me came pouring out of the speakers of my 63 Sky Blue Corvair. Not the ideal San Francisco car, except in terms of aesthetics. It's a beautiful set of wheels with a lovely backdrop to glide through, but those hills are murder on the clutch. I guess that sums me up perfectly, anguish in the name of beauty. Maybe I'm just addicted to loneliness, but I'm too steeped in denial to come to terms with it. Whatever, I've heard it all, and none of it makes complete sense. I was just driving around the city, thinking about Valerie and how much Rose reminded me of her. I had with me a few pictures of Rose that Tommy had left off, plus the address of the daycare center where she once worked and the addresses of friends, two in North Beach and one in Berkeley. That's all he could give me, he said. That, this was plenty, especially the pictures. They'd all be taken in Hawaii on their honeymoon. Rose was in a bikini in two of the shots, posing on the Oahu shore with Diamond Head in the background, and wearing a long white gown and flowers in her hair in another, standing beside a giant tiki statue. She was gorgeous in a simple way, accessible. I saw the down-to-earth quality Tommy had spoken of so proudly. Her smile set you at ease and seduced you simultaneously. There was this one photo, the one with the white gown, where she wasn't smiling. Unlike in the two bikini shots, she was alone here. She looked lost in thought, pensive, deep in a reverie of a faraway time or place. It looked like a moody album cover. This is the one that got to me, despite the sexual allure of the bikini shots, where Tommy was hanging all over her, his tan, well-honed physique glistening in the sun, or maybe drenched in post-cordial perspiration. She looked strangely cool and aloof in these shots, even while smiling and obviously having a good time. She was younger in these pictures, but Tommy said she still looked exactly the same. That's what threw me. Except for the hair color, she was a dead ringer for Valerie. I assume this is why Rose had permeated my consciousness so completely since I first laid eyes on her in the drive-in, but the faded quality of that photo didn't do her justice or make me realize the amazing resemblance to Valerie. I long ago discarded all of my pictures of Valerie. I had not laid eyes on her in six years, so my memory was a bit hazy, though the touch and scent of her were emblazoned in my heart for eternity. I surmise that Rose is perhaps a relative of Valerie, but that would be too coincidental. The only other explanation went even beyond coincidence into the realm of magic. I couldn't help but ponder that possibility, however, as I set the white gown photo on the dashboard and looked at it on and off, just driving through the cool December evening, dreaming. Valerie had auburn hair that bordered on red, and in fact Flora from the blood bank had reminded me of her. I discovered through my contract, contact to Nice that Flora was a patron of the arts and an aspiring artist as well, just like Valerie. I dated a few women since leaving New York, but as I said, my San Francisco track record left me much to be desired. Before Valerie, I had been something of a young stud, betting NYU English majors who read my column and thought I was going places. I was meeting people and hobnobbing with Midtown Literati, Greenwich Village Bohemians, and musicians from the New Way forefront. I once met Debbie Harry briefly backstage at CBGB, as well as David Byrne, Richard Hell, Iggy Pop, Mark Mothersbaugh, Lux Interior, Poison Ivy, and Joey Ramone. They were all pretty trash at the time, so I doubt they'd remember me. 
so what? I remember them. My old man was a cop in Brooklyn, my mother a cop's wife who wanted more out of life. I had a brother who committed suicide at age 18 after catching a late show of Dawn of the Dead. Jumped off the Brooklyn Bridge. They said it was drugs, but I knew better. It was hopelessness. I get that feeling sometimes now when I see the Golden Gate, and it scares me. I was a lost soul before I met Valerie and became lost again after she disappeared. Since then, I've been attracted to women who are reminded me of her physically and spiritually. Fora was the closest, until Rose. It goes back further than Valerie, though. Valerie looked like my mother, but my mother was remote and took out her bitterness on my brother and me. Why would I want someone who reminded me of my mother? Valerie not only physically resembled my mother, a voluptuously feminine Irish beauty and class act, but she was also moody, a tormented art artist struggling to find her voice with a sense of humor that could go from witty to vicious in the blink of an eye. Most women I had been attracted to fit that description, more or less. In Flora's case, I filled in what I didn't know about her with my imagination until she fit the bill, strictly out of desperation. But from the way Tommy described Rose, she was already made to order. Her letter and postcard displayed the same lost, yearning look that made me fall so hard for Valerie. Flora got that look sometimes, the crazy look. I'm a sucker for it. Call me a masochist. My mother eventually went mad and had to be committed. She's still locked up in a sanitarium in upstate New York. My old man got shot to death in an alley while off duty. The case remains unsolved. I have my suspicions. Someday I may go back and prove them, now that I'm a licensed PI. But I'm, I'm afraid of what I might find. That's no reason not to look for something, though. Cheers.